What's up, Daw Nation? Welcome to this episode of In the Daw with Julian Gray breaking down his song, Autonomous. You're going to be learning about polyrhythms, utilizing chromatic scales, and arpeggiating through different samples. Not different notes, different samples. So make sure to stay tuned for that, and we're going to get into the episode right now. Uh, Dead Mouse heard this song. I had met him at uh, Countdown, which is a festival here in Los Angeles. He heard the song and liked it enough to have me do a full EP for the label. This is the origin of Autonomous EP, so I thought this would be a good song to put on the stream today. The actual song itself isn't that complicated. I kind of designed this song as a way to stretch my musical legs. There's a lot of convention breaking in this song, and that was one of the goals of it. The main rhythm throughout the song is a 6-8 rhythm, but it's on a 4-4 grid. So it feels like triplets, but it always resolves to that 4-4 every eight bars. The melody is written in a Dorian scale, while the bass line is chromatic, and it rises chromatically. And there's a number of polyrhythms throughout the song to make the rhythm interesting. If we go back to the, the I guess the drop, if you will, um, you can notice that here. Kick is kind of dancing around the main melody. It's not a four to the floor pattern like most music like this. Uh, this song was kind of me stretching my musical legs to really experiment and break some conventions. That's ultimately why there's so many weird uh, convention breaking things in this song. So, so we can start from the beginning. We have just a four to the floor rhythm with some other drums. Just a bog standard kick and uh, clap. And I think these are both from a, no, this is from a Leviathan kit, which is from Black Octopus. And this is Kick 2, the kick synthesizer from uh, Sonic Academy. I love to use their stuff because it really gives you uh, control over what your kick sounds like. It allows you to really shape the kick for your song. So the kick used in the song was Kick 2 from Sonic Academy. The clap was from Leviathan. I think I introduced a snare towards the end section where I kind of switch up the rhythm. But the, the bulk of the drums is, again, this kick and this, this clap here from Leviathan. And then I have a hi-hat from Leviathan as well, doing a cool pattern here. So let me solo these three so you can hear the main drum section of the song. And again, it's very polyrhythmic. The kick kind of, it doesn't really fall into that 4-4 groove, like typical electro or this kind of house music, it kind of wanders around the rhythm a little bit on certain sections. I kind of hinted at that with the hi-hat as well. The hi-hat doesn't land exactly where it should on a rhythm like this. It's polyrhythmic and it, it lands slightly before the and, if you will, the eighth note. We get this cool bouncy effect here. It's almost offsetting a little bit, but it works very well with the bass that I have because the bass is chugging on an eighth note rhythm. We can toss that in. And as you can see, the bass now is setting that bouncy triplet feeling, um, which is that six, eight rhythm. Let me try to adjust the grid here so you can see that. I go to a 32 bar and then I believe a triplet grid. As you can see, it is solid. Yeah, it looks to be an eighth note followed by a gap of an eighth note and then an eighth note followed by a gap. That could be considered a quarter note with a little bit of tail. So we have these quarter note triplets going and then we switch to the 16th, or I'm sorry, the eighth note triplets here um, for the da, 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 da. And then we have these long sections. And I actually use Ableton's warp algorithm for this section here. Um, I don't have the original version of this, but what I did was I took a bass and I stretched it um, to get some of the digital distortion that Ableton presents when you start using uh, complex warp algorithms like that. You get this long held note here. As you can see, it kind of gets distorted as well. And then I froze that to audio here. And again, it's that, that I guess, quarter note uh, triplet feel. 
throughout with these nice little eighth note fills, little breaks and stuff to add to the polyrhythm nature of the song. It's very syncopated, I should say. So let's uh, unsolo these and see what else we have in the beginning section here. Um, not much more to it. I also have this thing called top section, which is another sound here. Which is doing the exact same pattern as the bass line, but I have a delay on it, or I should say an auto pan, and it is panning at a randomized rate, so it's creating even more of a sense of manic, if you will. Unfortunately, the audio, as we discussed earlier, isn't in stereo, so you can't hear the pan, but um, if you listen to the original song, you should be able to hear what I mean. And we segue into the next section with this little bell fill here. And as you can see, it is literally just a scale and we go up and then down. And um, in the stereo field, we're actually going from the left to the right with this utility tool here. So it's going doo -doo 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 across. And that really is a nice segue with the delay and the reverb on it into the next section here. And at this section, we kick in the full extent of the bass. Um, if I look in this bottom section here, as you can see, we have an EQ curve cutting off all of the bottom end from the intro. And we actually remove that curve here in the, I guess the verse or the, um, the first drop, if you will. So the, the bass really hits you at this section here. So one of the techniques I like to use when I write music is actually thinking of it subtractively. So instead of trying to add more to a drop or something to make it more interesting, I like to subtract from other things or other sections of the arrangement to make the drop more, more interesting or harder hitting, if you will. That's what I do here. I remove the high pass used on the, the bass and then it goes to a completely, the full sound of the bass, as you say. I also introduce a sub layer here. As you can see, if I solo it, nice uh, grungy sub bass. Pretty sure this is uh, Serum's saw wavetable. Most of the sound design in this in this song are the basic waveforms. I, I like to use the basic four for most of my production. In this section, we introduce that lead, which is the Dorian scale again. It's just ascending and descending on the Dorian scale, and it is nothing more than a basic wavetable. Let's go into the sound design here just to take a look. So we have the basic MG, which is essentially a basic, almost between a square and a triangle. And it makes this very cool 8-bit sound. You can go ahead and play this through, and you can hear that Dorian scale here. And to add more actually to that 8-bit effect, I actually have a bit reduction here, which is downsampling the lead on certain sections of the song. So as you can see, I automate that downsample. And it gives you like this falling into an, a video game kind of effect. So I have uh, some reverb on there. Uh, my favorite reverb is the Valhalla Room. And the reason I use this is to push the sound into the background. And a lot of no novice producers like to use reverb to make things sound bigger. And I think that's a kind of a misconception about reverb. Reverb is designed to emulate a space, not necessarily to sound bigger. Reverb is often thought of as bigger because when you put reverb on something, it sounds like it's like in a main concert hall or something. But really reverb sets something into a space. And that's what I use it for here. So I actually automate the reverb mix amount on a lot of things in the song, but I actually add more reverb in breakdown sections to push things into the background and to make things more spacious and ambient. And I actually like to dry things out when they get to the drop. Again, that goes off of like the idea that reverb is making things sound in a space instead of sounding bigger. And a lot of Again, novice producers like to put a ton of reverb on things to make them sound large, and it really starts to clutter up your mix when you start to use too much time-based effects like reverb and delay. So I like to keep things dry, and then I use a reverb automation when I want to break something down. So in the breakdown sections, it kind of throws it into the atmosphere more, and in the drop sections, it gets very dry, 
And as you see, when it starts to build up, I dry the reverb out. So it really starts to become more present in the mix. And that really uh, brings the lead to the forefront. And um, I use that reverb effect in all of the breakdowns and even in some of the drops if I want to push the element back into the mix a little bit more. Okay, so I have that. And then I go through the section here. We have a few more things. I have some atmospheric sounds. And it creates this really interesting harmonic tension between this and the main element which again, I think sets it into the atmosphere more. Then I bring that, that bass back in, we bring our kick back in and our drums back in, and then we have the lead dry out. As you can see here, I want to be more present and uh, work as a buildup. We head into the actual drop itself, which is the most complicated part. <laughs> So for this song, I used a lot of something called resampling. And what that means is I just took a sound, I recorded it, and then I reworked it in audio form. Um, this is our main sub for the drop section. And I think the original clip was similar to the sub used in the rest of the song. If I was to expand this out, you can hear it here. It's just nothing more than that. Same pattern that we used in the beginning of the song, but I go ahead and cut it up into micro slices and syncopate it like this manually. So you get this really interesting bass rhythm and I think it adds a lot to the, uh, the groove of the song. And then I have the bottom uh, basses here that I call them. Right, these are the main basses essentially. And they're following the same syncopation. Essentially, I did the same thing I took this audio here and I took clips of it and I rearranged them in such a way that it adds to the groove of the song and it makes the uh, syncopation interesting. So again, I was trying to break a lot of convention to this song and I kind of used the basses as a polyrhythm, um, which is kind of unconventional. You usually typically have the bass on like a, a standardized <laughs> grid of the song. But I, I, I swung it a little bit in this one to make it a little bit more interesting. And I'll just go ahead and sell these elements together so that you can hear um, each individual one first. Here's the two, and then here's with the sub. I think I add a little bit of a sliding bass here, which is just a serum with a filter cut off. Um, doing this, that's a nice little way to accent the end of the bar. I think the process, as far as processing goes, I have a saturator, a compressor on the bus itself, and then an OTT. I would imagine this is doing, yeah, not too much on the bass. Um, I don't want to over distort it, but I don't want to have it too dry to where it sounds like a saw wave. That's our basis, and then we have this float element here. And this is another frozen audio clip. I probably developed this in Serum. It sounds almost like an FM sine wave. Not too much going on there, um, but it's everything, like everything else in the song, it's side-chained very hard, so it adds a very nice groove. I think without the side-chain, this would sound like a pad. Yeah, not too interesting. So there's that, and then we have the, let's see, we have this click sound. This percussion, I believe. Yeah. And there's a lot of these micro percussion elements here to make, I guess, the percussive elements of the song more interesting. If you listen to this on uh, stereo, which we don't have on Zoom, unfortunately, uh, these are panned slightly around you. So when you play these percussive elements, it sounds like there's chaos happening around you. And let's go ahead and toss this lead back in. I do some really interesting... Uh, Chromatic dips uh, going from a D to another D, so full octave dip here. And that kind of segues into the, the lead again. So we go like this. And I do something really interesting with the portamento here. I actually automate it in Serum to make that little glidey effect that you hear in the song. That's interesting. I've never seen Ableton do that. Um, and then we have this thing, which is a nice little ambient background effect um, used to fill out the space. 
and I have that panning around you, and that really fills out the stereo image when this is introduced. And as I mentioned a few seconds ago, um, this section actually goes into a four to the floor grid instead of the polyrhythm mess that this section is. It feels more um, forward. So that's the basis of the main drop. Um, then we go back into a breakdown similar to the first one we covered. Back to the dry build up section. And then we actually switch things up um, and we go into this halftime drop right here. Using the same uh, percussion as before, um, it's just in a different pattern now. We have a 808 snare as well to add to that almost trappy feel here. And I introduce these drills and angle grinders. If you're curious, uh, the vocal sample in the song is my friend Joey. He said, this is not a drill. And I made the song as a pun almost. So this is not a drill could be taken one way, but in this section, I say, this is a drill, and we start to introduce these drill sounds. My good friend, Mr. Bill, actually uh, sent me a, a sample library full of construction sounds that he recorded, and um, I had to find a place to use them, and that's why I use them in the song. We have this drill sound here, um, which is a series of drill sounds here, and I have them arpeggiating, actually, randomly. So they're creating this really random drill percussion, and it's a very cool effect, I think. Very cool, and then I have an angle grinder like effect under that as like an impact. As far as the bases go in this section, I, I, realign, I realign them in a way that kind of hints at a halftime feel. So we have the sub going droop, droop, instead of droop, droop, so. As you can see, instead of going every time, I have it going every half time and in these sections where they were originally going double speed, now they're going normal speed like this. Looks like my mouse just disconnected. Yeah, that's essentially uh, the trap drop section too. I have a few more percussion elements here. I reuse this, this mel melodic section from the first drop, and then we have the bit section again. One thing I forgot to mention is this chromatic rise on the bass line. If we solo this, you actually notice that these notes go up chromatically and it creates this really interesting tension throughout the, the main drops of the song. And it feels like it's constantly rising, as you can see. And the tension just doesn't even stop until it resets back to the root note which is that dig. We have some uh, white noise effects going on here. Again, it's just, uh, you can't hear the stereo, but I have it separated stereo in the stereo image with this Haas effect used here. One ear is going one millisecond, one's 20 milliseconds, so they're getting a little bit of stereo separation there. I have a little bit of a filter going on here, so it's sweeping down and up, and that's creating this cool tension, um, rising and falling effect in the white noise. Let's give us a listen. And we have reverse, which is this. With the exception of some smaller things, that's essentially autonomous. Um, in this outro section, I just kind of revert to the standard versions of these bases that I made in Serum, as you can hear. I didn't mention this, but I have an accented ride that accents the kick every so often in the song. The exception of a few elements, that is pretty much the song. I have this nice little reverse clap, 
which I use throughout the song. Unfortunate that we can't hear the stereo image. You mentioned it's uh, kind of rooted in the Dorian scale. Yeah. So what was your kind of your creative or, or kind of your compositional approach initially? Like you started with um, kind of the melodies or kind of like the underlying chordal structure. I mean, it, it kind of stays in Dorian for throughout the song, but what kind of is your approach in terms of compositionally like you starting with the chords and melody and then you're kind of accent accentuating with uh, the different sounds or are you kind of thinking in terms of bass drums first yeah, you know yeah. what's what's kind of your overall approach yeah so for me um my approach to writing varies from song to song for this song in particular I started with the bass line, actually. I was messing with a patch and serum, and I got that dun, 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 dun. And I thought I could do something cool with a um, more syncopated bass line. So I froze that and created the main drop, if you will, of the song. But for most of my songs, when I write my more pop stuff, like It Is What It Isn't, the, the new one coming soon, it's called Touch. Um, I start on a piano and I write out the chords. For this one, I had the bass line written and the inspiration for that melody, I was just messing with the keyboard and I was playing a Dorian scale and it just happened to work. So I kind of rode around on the Dorian scale and I came up with that cool lead. It kind of gives like a pirates or like an mm. like a Irish kind of vibe. And I, I really enjoy that in the song. But as far as my normal workflow, I usually start on a piano or a guitar or something and I write a chord progression there. The the main bass is consistent throughout the entire song. Walk me through kind of the sound design that you came up with that because obviously it's very important because it's throughout the entire song. Yeah, absolutely. So it was originally serum and then I froze it and then resyncopated it here. I chopped it up and redid the syncopation. But the actual sound design, as you can see here, if I play it, isn't a few layers. I'm going to unfreeze these so you can kind of look at them individually. I don't know why there's like several arrows on my screen now. Can you see that? Yeah, man, this is wild. What's going on here? I think Zoom is acting <laughs> up or something. That's not me. If you can ignore that, the actual sound design is this uh, acid sound. And I'm using an FM modulator from, I believe it's LFO3. We're creating this nice one half on, one half off kind of effect. So, so we're going with this eighth note triplet feeling, but it really is feeling more like a 16th note, one on, one off. And then that's modulating our FM here. And it's FMing from this nice saw wave here, which is also creating sound. It's just an octave down. Yeah, so I have this FMing from this saw wave here, which is just the stock serum sound. And then I have a down an octave or two octaves for the sub. So it's our main sound here. As you can see, I'm actually automating some stuff. So I have an automation here for the serum delay, which is creating that nice little delay effect at the end of the bar. And it's very stereo. Again, you can't hear that over Zoom, but um, it's kind of, whenever it gets to the end of bar, it sets into the background. It goes da-da-da and by, almost behind your head. I'm also automating the LFO rate, which is creating that da 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 And these minor LFO automations, you can actually visualize in the, the audio version right here. You can see the syncopation that I do with these LFOs. Right there, and then. That's the basis of the, the main sound. I have a second layer to it um, right here. It's a little bit more aggressive. Um, I just use a different wavetable. Very similar sound, and I'm doing a similar thing. I'm, I'm, I'm automating the FM with this LFO right here. And we have a sub at negative two, and we're actually using a basic mini wavetable for this at negative two. So after freezing those two and then um, you know readjusting the syncopation of those sounds, you get this. Hey, Daw Nation, hope you enjoyed this episode of In The Daw with Julian Gray breaking down his song, Autonomous. If you did enjoy this episode, please like, comment, subscribe, and click the little notification bell so that you can get notified every time we put out a new episode. If you are interested in the Patreon, giving suggestions for artists to come on the show, having private lessons in electronic music production or social media marketing, entering to win the social media marketing consultation giveaway, or downloading the free preset that Julian used in this song, sounds like this. 
go ahead. There are links in the description for those things. And finally, there are episodes that are going to be popping up on the screen right now that are similar to this episode of In The Daw. Go ahead, click on those, watch those, and keep growing as a music producer. Also, check out our podcast, Behind The Daw, if you want more philosophical, emotional interviews. But with that being said, thank you so much, Daw Nation, and we'll see you on the next episode.